jealous of me Love's life with her again High in the tree Bending the knee The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I'm unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory Yeah, I realize just how beautiful you are now with your affections are for me You know how he loves us all Oh, how he loves us How he loves us Beat 
is ticking, and I'm so sick and tired of missing out. Now we show us who should have been We check the room, remember that nobody's keeping score. I'm tired of throwing pages in the wind. I gotta do something. Here goes nothing. Stay one of the rest of my life. Stay one of the rest of my life. You know, this uh, it's a message that I had planned to preach two weeks ago. And I came back talking about camp, and God showed up, and I knew better than to try to get up and preach after all that. And Because uh, when God shows up, you just stop let God do what He's doing. Amen? Right. And, uh, and then last week was family day, and what a day. I'm still living off. That I hope you are too. It was good. It's good to see a lot of folks in the house. But it was very, very good to see folks come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Daniel chapter six, verses one through ten. It says it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom a hundred and twenty princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion or fault for as much as he was faithful Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, say to thee, O king, he shall be cast in the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which offereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing of the decree. And now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed, and gave thanks before his God, as he did aforetime. Let's go to the prayer. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we do love you and we praise you, Lord. 
Lord, we just come before you right now, God. We just pray that you would speak to our hearts. God, that you would do a work in our lives this very morning. Father God, I pray right now, Lord, that you would empty me of everything that is myself. Lord, fill me up with your Holy Spirit and help me to proclaim truth this morning. Uncompromising truth of what you've just said in your word. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would, Lord, today for someone who's lost here in this place, God, that you would arrest the heart of that lost sinner. Lord, that right now, even as we're praying, God, that your Holy Spirit would begin to move upon their heart. And Lord, that they might be saved. Lord, that today might be a new beginning for them <coughs> as they find freedom in Jesus Christ. God, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us who are saved today. Lord, teach us to have boldness. To teach us, Lord, to be the ones that we're supposed to be under your authority. And God, to leave all consequences and results up to you. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, we're taking a look at the life of Daniel. We've been, uh, I was telling my brother this last night on the phone, you know, we have been spending our entire <coughs> year so far talking about a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice. And it could be really easy to... Uh, to just say, well, you know, we've heard enough about that, but there's just so many things that we can see in different people's lives in the Scripture. And we're just getting just a small look at the life of Daniel and his choice here to continue looking to God, to continue praying to God in spite of what had been determined, in spite of what was going to happen. Uh, but you know, Daniel is an example of living sacrifice, more than just in this past. When you look at Daniel, at Daniel you see... A, a man who is blessed with God. One of the things I notice when I read that passage and it, it is it tells us in verse 3 of chapter 6, it tells us that there was an excellent spirit in him. In other words, the spirit of the Lord was upon Daniel. And Daniel had chosen to seek God's face and seek God's favor. And God had, had, had granted him that and all that and so much more. Uh, he'd even blessed him with favor with the king and, and, and things of that. And he, he, he'd allowed him in a place where they should have been hostile to the Jewish people because they were captives in a foreign land. Listen, he had given him favor with King Darius. And Darius thought to set him over the whole realm. In other words, uh, the, all the, the area that Darius the king had conquered, he thought to put Daniel in charge of it all because he knew that Daniel would do what was right. And so Daniel was preferred by the king. But you know what? Daniel uh, didn't come to this because uh, he had an easy life. He didn't come to this because he never faced any challenges of any kind. As a matter of fact, uh, throughout the book of Daniel, you see multiple times where Daniel and his companions are confronted with choices about serving God or following man. You go all the way back to Daniel chapter 1. Those of you who were in vacation Bible school remember this, but you all go all the way back to Daniel chapter 1 and what you find is, is they're being tempted uh, with the, the king's meat and the king's wine to participate in that and to eat that and, 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 you know, and, and to be uh, controlled by the culture that's around them. And instead they ask the, uh, the person that's been set over them to supervise them and says, just test us, just give us a few days, just give us vegetables and water. See if we don't turn out better than those other boys. And what happens is, is guess what? They, they appear fair and, and they look better and they're healthier. Uh, they're smarter. God, God gives them and blesses them uh, at far above their counterparts. So God proves Himself faithful to them because they were faithful. Chose not to obey man, but rather to obey God. Because to have eaten of the king's meat and to have drank the king's wine, uh, they would have defiled themselves. And Daniel said that. And then we go on and we see uh, the ones we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The world had changed their name. That wasn't their given name. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they refused to bow down and worship the golden image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. They were faced with a choice. Do they worship God or do they worship this image that's been created by man? They choose, even though they know that death uh, is a possibility, they choose to be faithful to God and to worship God. They're thrown into the fire and they come out without a hair singe. And if they didn't already know that God was faithful, now we find, as we get to chapter 6 here, we find that Daniel is confronted. Whether he will choose to obey God or whether he will obey man. 
See, God is not interested. Let me just get this out there. God is not interested in partial obedience. You hear me? We're talking about being a living sacrifice. You know, you, you put a sacrifice. You think about sacrifices in the Bible. They weren't able just to take half the animal and sacrifice it and the rest of the animal stay alive, were they? Hello? They killed the animal. The animal died and gave itself and its blood was, was, was used as a sacrifice to, uh, to, to temporarily pardon their sin, so to speak. And, and, and what I'm telling you is, is look, uh, God is looking for us to be living sacrifices. He's looking for us to be completely dedicated, wholly dedicated, completely devoted to Him. No matter what the world says, no matter what the world is doing, you and I are supposed to place ourselves under the authority of God and His Word. Matter of fact, it's the same dilemma that uh, that uh, Peter and his uh, his friends faced in Acts chapter five, verse twenty nine, when they said, "We ought to obey God rather than men." That's the choice we are faced with. Listen, and it's becoming more and more prevalent in the society in which we live that we have to choose whether we're going to govern our lives by public policy and opinion, or whether we're going to govern our lives by the revealed word of God. God's Word says this in Deuteronomy 10, 20. says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, Him shalt thou serve, and to Him shalt thou cleave, and swear by His name. Yes. God said in His Word that it's Him. He's saying, look, I am to be at the center of all that you are. You should reverence me. You should serve me. You should cleave to me. You should focus yourself toward me. There you go. You know, whatever. Well, I mean, yeah, well, that's, that God, He just demands obedience. I, can't, I just can't stand for somebody to tell me what to do. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. You know what? I don't love God because He's, he's ruling me with an iron fist and telling me I have to obey Him. I love Him because He sent His one and only Son into the world to die for my sins so that I can be saved and spend eternity in a place called heaven and avoid a sinner's hell. Listen, I love God. Me. And I want to obey my God because He loved me first. He proved His faithfulness and devotion to me first. And He asked me to do the same. He asked me to be completely devoted to Him. He asked you, if you're saved, to be completely devoted to Him. See, see, God, we, we, we think... So many times people think, well, God's got to be here. We're always talking about, well, God's number one, and, and then my family. And then people get frustrated because so you've got to love your family, and you've got to provide for your family. So, you know, you can't really get God, you know, up there because your family's so important. Listen, if you just put God at the center of all you are and all that you've got, listen, everything else will line up because as everything comes in line with God and is attached to God at the center of your universe, Guess what? When something else falls apart, when your family or your job or the bills or something else, listen, God will still be constant. If you're devoted to Him, if you're focused towards Him, God wants us to look to Him for everything. I think about this morning, uh, Satan tempted the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he, he was trying to get him to bow himself down to the kings of the world, to the kingdoms of the world, and to promise him all that, all those kingdoms, if he could just fall down and worship him. And Jesus said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou serve. I'll tell you something, the world will try to offer you many things. But according to the Word of God, you need to follow God, you need to worship God. God said, You, you seek his kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. Listen, we forget when God has said something like that. It's not just cute. It's not just so we can get up and quote it. It is true for us to live by and apply to our lives. That if I seek God in His kingdom first, if I seek after God with my whole heart, then He takes care of everything else. And I have to focus my attention towards Him. See, I, I believe that we see in Daniel this type of walk that is fully committed to God, who is totally dependent upon God in every way. See, that passage that we read this morning, it really highlights that truth about Daniel. And of all the things that we've looked at in the Scriptures and said, okay, this person is a living sacrifice and this is how. 
this person is a living sacrifice, and this is how. And I'm sure there's been times where you can say, yeah, I see where I need to do that, or I see how that person was a living sacrifice. I'm going to be honest with you. For every person sitting in the room this morning uh, that is a Christian, that is a true born-again child of God, I want you to hear me. This is probably the most relevant truth that we've looked at so far. And I say that because today, more than ever, we are facing the reality of whether we will choose to obey God or man. It is before us every single day that we live. Are we choosing to bow to Christ or we, will we bow to the court of public policy and opinion? See, that's exactly where Daniel found himself in this passage that we read. What do you do when someone in authority makes a ruling that is contrary to what God has said. God had told them to look to Him. Matter of fact, Daniel was claiming a promise uh, that, had, that, had, that had been proclaimed that people would be blessed if they, if they bowed themselves down and prayed toward the temple. That's what Solomon, as he dedicated the temple, he prayed that God would bless the prayers and be attentive to the prayers of people who prayed toward that temple, this holy temple, God's dwelling place. And listen, he, he, he was claiming a promise. It wasn't just cute and cliche for him to go in and open his windows towards Jerusalem and bow himself down and pray. He was claiming promises that God would hear from heaven if prayers were uttered in that direction. He was being obedient to what had been said in God's Word. See, but he was in the midst of turmoil because the policy, the, the ruling that had been passed was for 30 days, no one could ask anything of any God or man except the King. And that makes sense. Well, how does that happen? Same way things happen to us today. Hello? Majority rules. We make laws in this land based on what majority says and it doesn't matter whether it's morally right or not. Hello? So what are you talking about, Brother Jim? We'll get there. Just hang on. You, 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 may, not have, you may not have seen this uh, when you were studying Daniel chapter 6 a couple of weeks ago. But in verse 7 it says all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm degree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save to thee, O king, he shall be cast into the lion. Daniel wasn't there. Daniel didn't agree to that. Daniel wouldn't have agreed to that. Do you know what he did? The Bible says that when he heard what the, the decree had been passed, when the, when, the, when the ruling had been signed, you know what he did? He did exactly what he did before. He continued serving God. He continued obeying God. He continued going back to God and asking God for everything he needed. In verse 10, that's what it says. It said, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, his windows being opened, and his chamber towards Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. He did what he did before. In spite of the ruling, in spite of what had been said, where were they going to cast him? They were going to cast him in the den of lions. He was not worried about himself. He was only concerned with being fully devoted to God. See, that one statement about Daniel that he continued to do as he always did tells us so much about his devotion. It tells us that he was more concerned with being in harmony with God than in line with man. I'm going to tell you, we need some boldness restored to the church. And I'm not talking about hatred. I'm not talking about being mean. I'm not talking about physical boldness. I'm talking about we need a holy boldness to be witnesses among the lost and dying world. Because listen, every day things are being done in our courts of law, in our government houses and things like that, listen, that are contrary to the Word of God. And it's not that we can change that, but what we can change is one soul at a time, one person at a time, preaching, thus saith the Word of God. This is the way. That's where our whole thing in Vacation Bible School was. This is the way, walking it. It's not this is the way, walking it on Sunday and do whatever you want to on Monday. It's this is the way, walking it. Choose you this day whom you'll serve. As for me and my house, will serve the Lord. Amen. It's not Sunday morning religion. It's a commitment and a relationship that goes beyond the walls of the church. Folks, at 
your job or at your school or whatever you're doing during the week need to know where you stand. Right. And it's not, you need to straighten up, get your life in line. Hello? Right. I don't know, I'm going to tell you something. I said this the other day. I don't know anybody that has ever come to Jesus by somebody doing this right here. <laughs> I don't know anybody who's ever come to Jesus from being browbeat with a Bible. But I know plenty of people who have seen a difference in a child of God's life and said, there is something different about you. I want it. I want it. I want to. I want to. I am saved today. Because of that lady's walk right there. I am saved today because she lived a life before me that proved she knew somebody I didn't know. And I needed to know him. And I needed my heart to be changed. I needed to be different because of I saw a difference in her. My, my Sunday morning religion and her relationship didn't work. They didn't add up. I had something that took care of me at the church house but didn't sustain me at the schoolhouse. Hello? Are you picking up what I'm laying there? Oh, yeah. We have to obey God. We can't worry about... You know, some people are so concerned about what somebody's going to think about them. He had the favor of the king. The king signed the decree. He thought Daniel was on board. They told him, oh, everybody's all about this. Let's poll America. Find out how they feel about something today. And then say, everybody's for it. They didn't come down here and ask me about it. Did you? Huh? We'll get there. I know. See, Daniel realized that everything originated from God. It did not originate from the king. We're so worried. Uh, if, I, if I'm a bold witness in my job, Brother Jim, I just don't know my boss will like that. Who cares? Are you indebted to that man or that woman who is your supervisor? No! The King of Glory died for you. That person may employ you, but they didn't die for you. They didn't die so that you could have eternal life. I remember I hadn't worked at the bank too long. I hadn't been the pastor of this church too long either. Boy, my life got turned upside down all at once. I, in, in a span of five months, I went to be the pastor of a church. I knew nothing about pastor of a church. Most of y'all know that by now. <laughs> <laughs> I took a different job, and I got married. There's a work for that. <laughs>
your commitment doesn't go beyond the pew and it doesn't go out into the world, it may not be able to save you either. Right. I want you to understand, in that moment, in that moment, I could have been thinking, is he going to fire me? In that moment, I could have been thinking, he don't get it. You know, what, what it wound up, it opened another door to witness to another person. That man's back in church today. What I want to, what I want to illustrate for you is, is what, what Daniel is doing is what you and I are supposed to do. Daniel is more concerned about being in harmony and line with God than he is about some decree that a king who favors him has issued. He's not trying to. He's not trying to be civilly disobedient. <laughs> he's just doing what he always did. Hey, guess what? You made a law I don't agree with. I'm gonna keep on praying because my God is able to deliver. You want to throw me in the lion's den? Have at it because my God is able. Is your God able? Amen. Is your God able? See, that's the biblical response for us to continue to do what we did, to recognize God and to pursue God in spite of what man is doing around us. The Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 1.10, he said, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Whose servant are we? To serve man, to align our morals and our ideals with man rather than to govern our life by God and the Bible, which is the revealed will and authority of God. Listen, to, to bring our lives under any other authority but this is to shape your life after something that cannot help you. If you, if you shape your life after anything other than this, it cannot help you. Its ends are destruction. There's a way that seemeth right unto man, and the ends thereof are the ways of death. It cannot help you. But God's Word, His authority, your life, listen, He's the one, the only one that will matter one day. So what are we to do? What do we do? We, what are we to do when we're living in a day and age where Christian values are just being eroded away? Man, what, what would you do? Let me just ask you. Let me just pose the question. What if the government decided today, today, that for the next month you can't pray? Anybody. You can't pray to anybody. You can't ask anybody but the local government agency for help for the next 30 days. What would you do? <coughs> they can't help as much. They're in debt up their eyeballs. <laughs> They would never do that. They couldn't afford to pay for it. What would you do? Would you pray anyways? What would you do? Let me, let, me, let me take it a step further. What if they told you for the next 30 days you cannot read your Bible? How many people would delete the Bible app from their phone right now? And say, well, I don't want to accidentally click on that. Then come down to my house. See, Daniel, there's no, there's no, there's no weighing in the balances. There's no, there, we don't see that in a lot of Daniel. He's not trying to decide is he going to obey God or is he just going to, is he just going to say, well, you know, I can go for 30 days. I mean, I've been praying every day for the last year, so I mean, I can go 30 days and not pray. There's no dilemma to Daniel. It says he knew that it was signed. He went to the house and he did what he always did. He prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed. And his prayers probably changed, folks, if they hadn't already. Because he knew, he knew that the Bible said, if my people which are called by my name, who humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. See, that, that, that God's waiting. I'm going to tell you where we're at. We're in a mess in America. And it's because we are not living by the promises of God's Word. We've allowed the court of public policy and opinion to shut us down and shut us up. And we've not, we've not claimed that promise that's in God's Word 
that if my people are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from him. Forgive us. God said he would do that. A lot of us want to shake our heads and, and complain about where morality's going in America and how things are going. When what are we gonna why don't we get back to doing what we're supposed to be doing? Jesus said this to the church at Ephesus. In, in Revelation 2, 4 and 5, it says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Do the first works. You know what? Some folks, as Christians, what we need to do, you know what we need to do? We need to find ourselves on an altar repenting to God for not being as in tune and in touch with God as we were when we first got saved. Some of us, when we first got saved, we wanted to read our Bible all the time. Some of us, when we first got saved, we wanted to get up and pray every morning and talk to God about what was going on that day and strength for the day and help us to stand and be a witness for you. And we did that for a little while. <laughs> and then it kind of faded. Commitment kind of slowed. We need to say, God, I, I'm going I'm to do the first words. See, here's where we're living at in America. You can get offended with what I'm about to say, but you have to be offended in Jesus. You're in the church house. You're not at the courthouse, okay? <laughs> what are we to do when we live in a country where nine justices can legislate morality in this country? Can take an institution defined by God and His Word, not by the Constitution of the United States, and determine who can and can't marry. Listen, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says one man, one woman, one lifetime. Right. That's what the Bible says. One man, one woman. Adam and Eve, forever. Well, what do you mean? Well, you, you, know, you know why? Lord help us. You know why we're at? Because the church has not been who it's supposed to be. Right. Because the people of God, even in the Old Testament, were not who they were supposed to be. See, here's how, here's how marriage got <coughs> messed up. And it didn't take the time to find the right mate the first time. So then we entered into divorce and all those things, and it leads us down those paths. And that's not unforgivable, so don't get mistaken about what I'm about to say. But the Bible does say that Jesus said that the writ of divorcement was given because of the hardness of man's heart. Right. 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 Having to do with God. And so we redefine that, that now we don't have to be one man, one woman for one lifetime. Until now we don't have to be even a man and woman for a lifetime. So really, Jeff, you're, pre you're preaching a pretty tough message about that. Is this all this about? No, that's not all it's about. Here's, here's the problem. Folks, as ruling after ruling has been made in this country, Christians have silenced and accepted and shut up rather than praying, God help us to be light among the darkness. God help us to be bold and to speak truth in love. I told you earlier, you ain't going to browbeat somebody with the gospel. Let me tell you something. You show somebody you love them, you really care for them, you care more about their soul than you do about them having the lifestyle they have, you might see a change. Because I'm going to tell you what, this sin that we're dealing with is no different than any other sin we can come up with. It's not just, oh, homosexuality, homosexuality, homosexuality. Listen, it's just as bad as anything else that goes on. Drunkenness, drugs, adultery, thieves, lying. It's all wrong before God. It's all wrong. I'm not here to probably one, one sin. What I'm saying is, is, church, we have to decide, are we going to be the church? Are we going to bow to what man wants to do? Are we going to stand up for what God has already said? See, here's the reason where we're at, because the church in many ways has bowed to man. See, think for instance, standing by and watching the Bible and prayer being removed from school. 
You don't believe that wasn't the downfall of this country? You need to check up. We took God and the Bible and prayer out of school. Downhill slide ever since. Been downhill ever since. Because for some folks, I hate it. But listen, for some folks, that was the only Bible they ever had. Their parents weren't bringing them to church. The church buses weren't going and picking them up. They weren't being brought in to the churches by the masses to hear the word. Some of, the, some of those kids, the only word they were getting was in the schoolhouse. You know what Christians said? Well, that's okay. So, oh, well, we got clubs and this and that. Listen, who do we obey? I'm not pinning this on the teachers either, by the way, because here's what happens. Some of y'all better hang on to your hands. Here's what happens. The teacher comes and says, boy, you know, I, I can't do this anymore because now they've made this law. And you know what Christians do? Yeah, you better be careful. You better, you better be careful. You might lose your job if you read the Bible in school. Why, if you pray with that student, you might be in trouble. Yeah, you better be careful. Well, many Christians continue to place those doubts in other believers who otherwise, if they've been encouraged and said, I am with you, you stand up for what's right. We're praying. We're behind you. We're with you. Churches instead said, yeah, you better be careful. You don't want to lose your job. Not just about that. The Bible prayer we could go on and on. But here's what we've done, folks, by not being and not having the holy boldness to continue in the will of God in spite of what the world chooses to do. We have ushered in the degeneration of the culture of this country. Because Christians did not do like Daniel and continue the things that they were doing before these rulings were made. See, here's the thing. We can argue and say, well, people are going to have this happen or that happen if they disobey the law of the land. Daniel was going to be thrown into the den of lions. In verse 7, it says that if anybody does this, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Daniel was going to face certain death, but listen, he was not worried about himself because he knew what God was able to do. Matter of fact, they set him up because they knew he would continue praying. And in verse 11 it says, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And as soon as they caught him, they turned him in. Because they thought they would rid themselves of Daniel. But you know what? We know how the story turns out, don't we? Thrown into the den, and he doesn't die. It may sound cute, but I serve a God who can close the mouths of lions. I serve a God that is able to do exceedingly, exceedingly above all I can ever ask for. He's able to do more than I can imagine. He's able, He is able, He is able. How often do we forget that? Or maybe it's not that we forget it as much as we fail to believe it. When we read of people like Daniel, we've been talking about being a living sacrifice all this time. These are real people. These are real lives. These are real situations. And we see how God works in their lives. We see the deliverance and the provision. We see how God honors obedience. And all these things should be telling us, just be a living sacrifice. Just choose to obey God. And God will work out the details. But for many folks, when it comes time to take a stand on thus saith the Word of God, or when it comes time to speak up and be bold, we buckle. As if pleasing men, as if fitting in, as if being accepted, or whatever consequences might come from obedience to God, rather than bowing down or giving in, that the consequences of obeying God are something to be feared. I'm not worried about being marginalized or even being accepted because I stand on the Word of God. And according to the Word of God, one day, we win. One day, all these unjust rulings will vanish under the authority of King Jesus. 
Because of His kingdom, there will be no end. See, here's the thing, folks. You're, you and I, 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 I've been preaching this and, and, and about being a living sacrifice, and I believe it's important. I believe it's imperative we get this. Because there is coming a day, there is coming a day, that we all, number one, will stand to give an account for our lives before God. But I'm going to tell you a day we may face in this country sooner than we think. It's a day when we have to face imprisonment or death for standing on the Word of God. So you're just trying to scare people, Brother Jeff. I'm just giving you a reality check. If the church stays silent, I don't know where this end. Matthew 10, 28, though, tells us this, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know who it says fear there? Fear God. People may hurt you. They may hurt your feelings. They may, they may hit you. They may kill you. But there is but one that can say, depart from me. I never knew. And that's God. So to know God is first and foremost. And to obey God and to fear God is the most important thing we can do beyond having a relationship with Him. See, the only person we need to be concerned about is God. Jesus says there in that Scripture, there's not a thing anyone can do to you on this earth that will really matter. But what will really matter is if you don't have things right between you and the one that can say, depart from me. I never did. The one that can cast you into that place called hell. See, many people will find on Judgment Day that their divided loyalty, their partial obedience was only evidence of a much deeper problem. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus said, Matthew chapter 7, that there be many that would say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, in thy name have we prophesied. In thy name have we cast out devils. In thy name have we done many wonderful works. And I'll profess in them, depart from me. I never knew you that worketh in equity. Jesus Christ said there'll be people in judgment day who will gasp. Who'll say, I'm not saved. I'm not right. See, John described it this way in 1 John 2.15. I'm almost through. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. See, to not have the love of the Father is to be lost. To be more concerned about the world and the things that the world's offered you and the worldly system and the world, worldly rules is to not really know Jesus Christ. See, if you don't have the love of the Father, you will be eternally lost one day. If you really don't know Him this morning, then you need to. And He invites every person to come to Him. Matter of fact, He did everything. He did everything He could to make it so plain how much He loves us because He sent His Son into the world to live a perfect life and to die a little death so that you can have life. Listen, nobody else is offering that to you this morning. The world sure ain't offering you that. They're offering you temporary pleasure. They're offering you temporary gain. But what the Lord is offering you is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the only way to get that today is to know Jesus Christ as the Lord. So you have to make a decision when you bow to to God now, or you bow to Him on judgment day. If you bow to Him now, you'll be saved for all eternity. If you have to bow on judgment day, it's not going to be true. Because the Bible says one day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. But I want to confess it now, not confess it now. Right? <coughs> we'll, do, we'll do it anyways, willingly. But listen, we do it now, or we may do it. Head to drive my eyes across the